Uh, good morning. I'm Harold Krent. I'm the Dean at Chicago Kennett. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the ninth Supreme Court Intellectual Property Conference. Um, as you know, the IP world is flourishing. We have six faculty members who are interested in IP. We offer about 40 courses. We have uh, the first international intellectual property LLM program in the country. We have a PTO patent hub that where we help local entrepreneurs uh, protect their innovations and empower the community. Uh, we even have a degree in intellectual property management and markets that's not a law degree, talking about how to leverage, monetize um, intellectual property. So it's, it's exciting, and that growth has mirrored what goes on in the Supreme Court. So I'm happy that you're here today to think about not only the Supreme Court, but PTAB, and how the practice of intellectual property has so changed over the past um, couple of years. And I have the pleasure to thank our conference sponsors, uh, Morgan Lewis, uh, McAndrews, McDonald Bainan, Pulsinelli, and Seifarth Shaw, but an even more pleasure to introduce Ed Lee, the director of our intellectual property program. Ed? Thank you, Hal. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to welcome everybody on this uh, beautiful Friday. Uh, Thank you for coming up, coming, uh, waking up bright and early today to hear a lot of discussion about patent law. Uh, this is our ninth annual Supreme Court IP review, as Hal just mentioned. But this year, it's a special edition that we are focusing purely uh, or 99% on patent law and also the PTAB, uh, especially in the afternoon. Uh, we've organized that section in conjunction with uh, members of the PTAB Bar Association, so we thank uh, them for their contribution and support as well. Now, I'll be speaking later this morning, so I, I don't want to hold up the show because our first panel is raring to go. Uh, I do have just two housekeeping matters to get on the table. The first one is very quick. I know many of you uh, want to get onto the Wi-Fi. Uh, the password uh, is on page six of your program. Uh, if you're having trouble finding it, uh, just visit the desk outside and uh, one of our assistants can help you. They also have a sheet uh, which walks you through the same steps as in uh, the program, uh, which was emailed to everybody who registered for the conference. Uh, more importantly, uh, for those of you who are attorneys uh, seeking CLE, uh, due to uh, a new rule uh, by uh, the MCLE Board of Illinois, uh, we're required to uh, get verification of attendance at each session as opposed to the entire conference. Uh, to implement this rule, uh, we are asking you to fill out on your blue form that you should have obtained from the front desk uh, a, what's called a CLE session code that will be displayed and announced at the start of the session and at the end of the session. Most of our sessions do not have PowerPoint presentations as a part of them, so the slide will actually be uh, on uh, for a fair amount if there are no other presentations. This, pres this uh, session code is A1023, and just simply write that down on your blue sheet for the 9.05 to 11 a.m. panel. Uh, so. If you have any questions, it's explained on the last page of your program, and also you can feel free to ask somebody at the registration desk uh, about the process if you're having any questions. Uh, we've implemented this procedure uh, in a conference before this, and it worked successfully, so uh, we're hoping the same uh, success occurs today. Okay, without further ado, I will just turn it over to our moderator, David Klo, uh, partner at Pulsinelli, for the first panel. Thank you, Ed. It's nice to be back, and it's nice to look out at the audience and see former classmates and regulars at this symposium. Uh, I hope we can provide you with at least a little bit of entertainment today. Uh, my panelists today are John O'Quinn from the law firm of Kirkland & Ellis, a man that works in the trenches like I do, uh, Professor Sapna Kumar from the University of Houston, uh, uh, Houston Law Program, I want to get this right. Uh, Professor Bernard Chow of the U University of Denver Sturm College of Law, and Professor St Stephen Yelderman from the Notre Dame Law School. And today, as you know from the program, we'll be talking about 
Western GECO. I was uh, reminded of the proper pronunciation at 5.30 this morning when, uh, <laughs> when Ed Lee sent out a notice to the panel that it's not gecko. This is not about uh, amphibians. <laughs> The case we're talking about today raises the question as to whether a patentee can recover damages for lost foreign profits for infringement in violation of 35 U.S.C. 271 F2, which defines infringement as supplying from the United States, that's a key word in this case, of a component or components that have no substantial non-infringing uses, so long as the infringer knows that, that, that there are no other uses and intends to assemble a complete device overseas. And the question is, what is the proper uh, remedy in this case? Um, I think we should take a step back here, first of all, to find out how and why uh, 271 came about. Uh, it came about in response to a case that I will allow my panelists to discuss a little bit and how we got here with this particular statutory provision. Well, specifically, I mean, 271F came into existence uh, when Congress reacted to the Supreme Court's decision in a case called Deep South. Uh, Deep South had basically said, if you look at a fact pattern where somebody who exported something from the United <laughs> States would be an infringer, but instead they took it apart, sent it out, with the intent that it would be reassembled, that that was not itself actually an act of infringement uh, within the United States, and so there could be you know, no damages, no recovery uh, from that because there was no injury, there was no act of infringement. Uh, the, that, was, that was essentially overturned by Congress in enacting 271F, and 271F, even though it's kind of a narrow provision that a lot of you've probably never heard of before the Western GECO case went up to the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court has had kind of an interesting fascination with 271F. It's taken an unusually large number of 271F cases, you know, over the last few uh, decades. And I think there's a reason for that. I think it's part of the continuing conversation that Congress and the Supreme Court will have about statutory matters. And so in this case, uh, my client, Western GECO, argued that the, the Federal Circuit had essentially got it wrong in how it was interpreting 271F and that that was gutting uh, what uh, Congress had intended in enacting the, the statute. There were also other issues in, in play and perhaps other consequences, and we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit more, but that's part of, uh, of how the, the case then uh, got to the Supreme Court and got the attention of the Supreme Court. The only thing I'll add to that is just a lot of the dilemma in this case was how narrow was 271F? Were they merely, was the, was Congress merely trying to close a small loophole with regard to um, the particular facts of that case? Or were they trying to do something more broad in terms of being able to protect U.S. patent holders when, you know, someone is trying to clearly circumvent U.S. patent law by disassembling uh, manufacturing parts and shipping them abroad. So that was part of, part of the excitement, I think, in this case. Um, I don't think I have anything else to add on Deep South, I mean. <laughs> but here we are. Here, I mean, what do you want me, uh, so, I mean, I mean, I, well, if you don't, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I'm anxious to get to the next question, because I think that <laughs> this case has nothing to do with 271F at all and is actually about damages, but that's starting to put my yeah, substantive exactly. cards on the table, okay. so. That's where, yeah. that's where I am, too. Well, as I said, this is, uh, what is the proper remedy? Um, you know, there, as, as we all know, there's a, there's a presumption that federal statutes apply only to the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. How did we get to what some people are calling the extraterritorial application of, of U.S. law that gave us the result in this case. Yeah. Let's start at the other end. <laughs> in terms of the facts of this case, so we have, I mean, it happens to involve 271F as we were discussing, but I think you could get essentially the same damages question anytime you have someone exporting either components or completed an invention uh, outside the United States where those products go downstream and work competitive harms to the U.S. patent holder. Um, that's what happened in this case, as John could 
who was doing the trial can probably tell the story in much more uh, grueling detail, much more interesting detail. Um, but essentially the claim was that this U.S. domestic infringement caused goods to go out into the worldwide stream of commerce and work harm to the patent holder and other markets, and there was a financial loss to that. And the question is, what does it mean to make the patent holder whole in that situation? Do we narrowly focus on the infringing conduct that, folk, that occurred in the United States, or do we take a global view of their bottom financial line, the bottom financial line, um, regardless of where the financial losses might have occurred jurisdictionally? Yeah, I mean, I, I take this even more general and say that, you know, for, for years now, we've been seeing uh, patent holders uh, seek something we call a worldwide damages theory. Uh, uh, and so it doesn't just go to sales or exporting, which is what 271F is about, but it goes beyond that. We've seen the, the, the underlying cases in the Federal Circuit that are not uh, uh, Western GECO or like power integration and Marvell, right? And, and, and at least in Marvell, the situation was that the accusation is that infringement occurred during R&D, that they made things and during the sales cycle. So they made, they used the technology during the sales cycle. And obviously, uh, Marvell's, based, Marvell's based in uh, Silicon Valley. Their lab's based in Silicon Valley. Their sales, their sales force is based in Silicon Valley. They test products with uh, prototypes in Silicon Valley and show, show on boards how these things will work. And that can cause, theoretically, the sales everywhere in the world, right? And so that's, I think more fundamentally, that's the concern here is, are we going to extend sort of causation pr principles or make whole principles all the way from uh, making something in a lab in the, in the United States and saying, well, the consequence of making that thing in the lab in the United States is, in fact, sales all over the world. And are we going to say that makes someone whole if that, you know, if we uh, say, if we're found that there's infringement there? One thing I think we can't lose sight of is it's tempting to just look at this from a patent perspective, but this is a more general doctrine that applies to all sorts of areas of law. And really, until the Rehnquist Court, extraterritorial applications of U.S. law was super common. And the doc this canon of construction was only resurrected you know, relatively recently. Um, and until this case, it had never even been applied to a pure damages provision. So you know, it's, it's tempting to look at this from patent law specifically and say, well, you know, there's, there's problematic things that can happen if U.S. patent law reaches too far. But there's also like broad ripple effects we have to think about to other areas of law um, if we make this canon too strong. Yeah, I think one thing that's interesting about this case is it, it's a little bit like the, uh, uh, the, the proverb about the, the blind people and the elephant. If you touch different parts of it, you kind of think of it in, in different <laughs> ways. You can conceptualize this case as involving extraterritorial issues. You can also, and I think the Supreme Court uh, didn't think that it necessarily did. And, and what I mean by that is the, the act of infringement uh, occurs when, uh, when, when there's the export with the intent to combine. Uh, that was a domestic act of infringement. And so there's a lot of talk about extraterritoriality, and, and I think there are aspects of this that have an extraterritorial feel to it because you were then uh, measuring damages by uh, extraterritorial consequences, that is, uh, things that happened outside the, the United States. But the injury was domestic. And so the question here, uh, and, 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 and uh, I think it's also fair to say, ION didn't dispute that Western GECO was entitled to damages. The question was, what damages and how do you measure them? ION didn't dispute, for example, that a reasonable royalty would have been appropriate. So the question really boiled down for a domestic act of infringement, how do you measure those damages? And is it impermissible to look at the, uh, the, the damages that occur outside the United States based on a domestic act of infringement? Um, it's interesting that you were saying that this may have a broader application. It seems to me in the language, in the opinion, they were deliberately trying to not expand this to create what these guys are afraid of being a giant mess. Yeah, no, J Justice Thomas wrote the opinion and uh, he was very precise and, and, and indeed said that they were deciding this not just on 271F grounds, but 271F2 in particular. Um, you know, when you look at F1 and F2, I don't think that there's an appreciable uh, difference there that, that leaps to mind, but the court was clearly um, deciding the issues before it and not deciding more. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't consequences to the to the court's rationale, and I think that's something that 
uh, that will be debated, debated and discussed and, and no doubt litigated, uh, but, but the court was very precise about what it was deciding and that's what it was deciding. Well, in, the, in, the, uh, in terms of the reasoning being extended, and this goes to Stoutman's point as well, um, it's, the court has a certain amount of fake caution in this case, or it appears cautious, when one of the arguments in this case was that, look, just extra, presumption against extraterritoriality shouldn't apply to damages provisions at all. And the court says, well, we're not going to reach that, because that could affect other areas of law. But then the court goes ahead and applies the presumption to a damages provision, as Stoutman just pointed out, for the first time. So it's a little bit, I mean, I, 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 almost disingenuous to say like, oh, we're being really cautious here, when in fact your caution is actually leading you in a direction that's going to have consequences for other areas of law as well. You can't decide not to decide something like that in a case like this. Yeah, I think, I think the principles that the court relied on don't, aren't really distinguishing, certainly not F1. I don't think they really distinguish A, 271A, uh, and then the question is, uh, you know, whether they distinguish pet, uh, remedies in general, right? So, I mean... Uh, you know, you can say it's only this particular statute, but if, if the, the, the logic flows for everything else, it's, it's not clear why they're only saying this particular statute. Yeah, I don't think this is a narrow decision. I mean, I think that they could have focused on the fact that the activities in, in the case were happening in, in international, in um, the high seas, in international waters, and used that as a way of deciding the case as well, that no countries law apply, clearly applied to the activity that was going on. And instead, nobody, it, it's touched a little bit in the dissent, but they stayed way clear of that. And they could have been done much more narrow, saying, well, there's no comedy concerns in this case. You know, we're not answering today what would happen if this was going on in France. Uh, but they didn't choose to, you know, give us that narrow of an opinion. That would have been that would have been really narrow. <laughs> like yeah. Only on the high seas, like well, is the yeah, damage. No yeah. Other yeah. Law applies. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, so I mean, uh, so uh, so one of the uh, sort of the context of this case is obviously that you know it's, it doesn't just affect U.S. law; it actually affects how companies play internationally, right? And uh, up in, I mean, we do have an international scheme where companies get patents in individual countries. They enforce country, uh, those patents in those countries, and they get remedies in those countries. And so what's odd about this particular situation is, say, you are, uh, we now can have, a, have an infringement in the United States because the infringement took place in the United States by exporting particular components. But the sales of, it affects sales in, say, France or the EU, and therefore damages are judged by a American standard and not by the EU standard, and not, you know, presumably, even if there's not an EU patent, right? Um, uh, and that may be because the, the patentee did not decide to get one or simply it was rejected on slightly different standards of patentability. Yeah, the, the comedy concerns in this case are uh, honestly, I think, a little bit of a, a red herring um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, first, I think it's very telling that the United States, which filed an amicus brief uh, in support of Western GECO, had no concerns uh, concerns about that, and if, if there was an institutional actor who should be concerned about that, well, it would be uh, the United States government. But but I think the dissent, Justice Gorsuch, um, teased this up as though this is some unusual thing where you might have a situation where both a U.S. patent might apply and a foreign patent might apply. But think about every time a product is imported or exported, right? You've got two patents, potentially, that apply to that act, right? I mean, in, when you export something, it then gets imported somewhere. So you could be simultaneously effectively infringing the patent from the country where it's being exported and the country uh, with the patent uh, where it's being imported into. And you know, the answer may be, well, there's damages for one of those, but not for the other. Uh, but that is more you know, based on sort of common law principles of double recovery and, pre and preventing double recovery, as opposed to the idea that you, know, you, you can't look at uh, at harm that ends up being caused by the patent, uh, by, by infringement of the patent. And specifically, the way we usually deal with that conflict domestically, if you have multiple acts of infringement supply chain, we apply patent exhaustion. You know, the first place in the chain, someone's paid a license fee, um, the, the goods are exhausted down the chain, and after Lexmark, it looks like the rules versus impression products, looks like the rule's going to be the same way internationally, where once a sale has occurred pursuant to a license or potentially a judgment in one country and the goods move abroad, you'll have something like exhaustion of the satisfaction of judgment rule um, working worldwide. So we have existing documents to deal with that very problem 
And um, it very much looks like the international solution is going to be the same as the domestic one, which is an extension of exhaustion. Um, <clears throat> we focused a little bit here, a little bit, mostly on uh, 271 F2, but the, there is a lot of commentary out there about the potential effects of these, as we said a little while ago on 271A. I was wondering if we could get some comment on that. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see this touch 271A, or at least it's going to be really unusual cases if we ever do, because 271F, Congress was very clearly writing the statute to deal with a situation where goods are being you know, shipped abroad and activity is occurring abroad that gives rise to U.S. liability. And in 271A, I feel like the way that the the language of 271A is so clearly focused on domestic activity that I think it would be very difficult to make the argument that uh, Congress intended for it to apply beyond the U.S. borders. Yeah, so well, I was going to say, I, I guess I disagree with that. I mean, so my... I do too. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like 271A and F are sort of a scheme together. Of course, A was laid down first. Um, and... I agree with you that the way Congress laid it down looked like they put down very strict extraterritorial limits on uh, what you could cover for in 271A, but 271F is the same thing, and then they, and they ignored that. I mean, 271F is just simply, uh, it's 271A, except that we also allow for infringement when you ex export components separately. Um, uh, and 271 is saying, well, we allow for infringement when you ex export the, uh, the, the whole system as a whole. And to me, it doesn't seem like uh, you get a different uh, result, and that and that's my biggest concern because, uh, frankly, I think 271F is a fairly, even though the Supreme Court has paid a lot of attention to it, I think it's a fairly small piece of the overall mixture, and at least in the two prior cases where the Federal Circuit cases where the rule went the other way, we saw, you know, damages increase maybe four or five fold when uh, we went from a <laughs> domestic damages regime to allowing the royalty base or the, the, the damages base to be an international one. So we're going to see a, a lot larger damages figure. And so certainly it's, certainly it's going to be tried. You saw power integration file an amicus brief in this particular case. Um, I would completely agree with you, Sapna, if this case had been decided on the first step of the extraterritoriality inquiry, whether the presumption had been rebutted. You could say it's been rebutted in the case of 271F because Congress was specifically trying to reach conduct as was occurring outside the United States. But because they did this weird thing where they started at step two and said, let's ask where the focus of 284 is. You know, it's a pretty short statute. Damage is adequate to compensate for the infringement. It's the relevant language here. Oh, the word infringement. Well, where's that happening? United States. And once, once that's your methodology, we're just asking, well, where's the infringement occurring? I think all 271 comes in. All of those are acts within the United States. That, that we're supposed to ask where the act of infringement is occurring until they add something to 271 that says, oh, and also sales at farmers markets in France count as U.S. infringement, then I don't see how you could get a different result um, for foreign damages. Interestingly, though, I mean, it just it happens to be, this is what's a little bit, I mean, the, the opinion, uh, it, it just seems so fortuitous that 284 happened to have been worded that way, where the court could hook on the word infringement, and then that would, like, lead them on a trail of crumbs back to the United States. But I would contrast 284 with copyrights damages provision 17 U.S.C. Uh, 504A1, which happens to say the copyright owner's actual damages, and then it has a restitutionary remedy as well, any additional profits of the infringer. Putting aside the restitutionary part of it, the copyright owner's actual damages, the court could look at that statute, which I think to everyone else means the same thing as 284, actual damages, damages adequate to compensate for the infringement, and say, oh, the most important word here is actual damages. Well, that means that we're, you know, this would be a foreign application of the statute. So the methodology here is kind of weird, and it seems to be sort of uh, potentially, uh, it could be narrow almost by accident in the sense it might apply to patent law but not copyright. And then, of course, there's this question that I find very interesting that might be 70 years or whatever is asked in a real case, as opposed to by an academic on a panel, um, whether or not copyright uh, profit disgorgement can look uh, abroad. 
There was a case from the 1940s um, that, and the Second Circuit case that said that, that it could, but I wonder as we're now apparently applying the presumption against extraterritoriality to damages provisions, I'd be interested to see how the court, if it applied the same method methodology, uh, would interpret the copyright restitutionary remedy. I can respond to that. Yeah. And I think Morrison versus National Australia Bank means that we're not going to have a world quite so grim in terms of in National Australia Bank, the court really emphasized the fact that just having some activity in the U.S. isn't a, isn't a sufficient domestic hook in terms of being able to avoid the um, presumption against extraterritoriality. Rather, you have to have the situation where the core activity you know, that's going on in the U.S. is what Congress was intending to regulate in that statute. And so with regard to 271A, I just don't think we're going to run into the problem where all this activity is going on outside the U.S. and we're somehow able to drag it into 271A. Oh, oh, just we wouldn't be able to establish direct infringement under the terms of yeah. 271 oh, I see. I mis yeah. yeah, I misunderstood you. Yeah, well, so, I mean, maybe that's a, an answer. I, mean, I guess Bernard would say these are inducement cases, like the R&D cases that keep you up at night. Oh, yeah. The, well, the R&D case isn't an inducement case because the, the, uh, you do the... You oh, know, they're making a first prototype and then... They're, they're, yeah. they're actually prototyping in the United States. So, yeah. yeah so yeah. those are direct infringements that cause overseas uh, damage. They, they essentially cause all their sales everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So that's how you get to 271A <laughs> yeah. in prototype. I do agree with you. It would be easier if they did it on the first step. Yeah. Well, wh whether you're under 271A or F and you're thinking about these issues, I mean, some of the things that... Uh, that you're talking about sort of then naturally lead into questions about proximate cause. And the you know, footnote three of, of the opinion uh, that just sort of flags, look, we're not addressing issues vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis proximate cause, uh, but th that is a way of potentially limiting even just the application of, uh, of, of 271 uh, F itself. Now, I tend to think that proximate cause is gonna be a fairly straightforward thing uh, to to, to prove and is uh, proved in a very straightforward way in the 271F context because you know, 271F requires the intent to combine um, and you don't have that, uh, whereas you don't, necessarily, you don't have that type of intent requirement, say if you were talking about 271A. Um, but but that is, is an open question, not just in the 271F context, but were it to be expanded to the 271A context, then you could expect that there'd be a lot of discussion about proximate cause and I know Professor Yelvelton uh, wrote a very thoughtful amicus brief on this issue in, in, in our case and has given some real thought to that. Well, thank you. And uh, you, I was just about to say, actually, I think proximate cause is a really important principle here, um, on, on true, true to form. Um, but I would actually suggest that proximate cause be an important limitation in 271F cases as well. I mean, imagine like a, a variant on Bernard's hypothetical where someone exported a component of a prototype with the intent that it be combined in France to make a prototype that then would be sent to China for duplication and manufacture. So proximate cause would have a role to play there in, in cutting off that causal chain. It just, they wouldn't cut it off at the prototype. So it wouldn't prevent you from recovering from the actual, I mean, the, the first goods that were manufactured under 271F, but it would play an important role to get um, the downstream goods that, uh, you know, come, come from there once the prototype's duplicated. I know that's not what you, 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 you know, you, it wasn't the case you had in mind, but I just think it's worth uh, emphasizing is sort of, you know, in any case, if you have no proximate cause limit, you can just go crazy thinking about all the repercussions of like, oh, well, um, we, uh, we were short on capital, so uh, we weren't able to launch a new product because you didn't pay us patent damages earlier. And like, there's just things that we, I think, trained as lawyers in the U.S. tort system just know these proximate cause limits are out there and we don't even think of these crazy theories because we just know that they're going to be rejected or ought to be rejected. And so we shouldn't take that for granted. Well, it just, it, it just strikes me that it was a decided decision to stay away from proximate cause. Uh, could you give me a feeling as to why they just sort of pushed that away? Because as I was thinking, <laughs> just to drive me crazy. Had, that's that that's my theory. <laughs> Does anyone have any idea why they didn't? Why they were so cautious? They didn't even want to opine whether or not proximate cause applies I, to patent I cases. I don't recall anyone's brief other than yours dealing with that particular issue. I mean, so they may not have felt that it was well. Uh, you know, we covered it a little I, bit in the hip brief, but yeah, not. 
I would assume the Solicitor General's brief mentioned the word proximate cause. But I don't I know. So I mean, to me, the, I mean, the distinction is the factual distinction that you would want to probably make is sales that end up being overseas and causing some damages by, by taking other sales, or sorry, exports that end, end up taking other sales. Those are sales that are probably proximately caused, right? Um, by the export, so infringement under 271F. Uh, but what, what, what may then cut the causal chain off is these remote, situ these sort of secondary steps where, all right, we made a prototype. Oh, we, we, you know, we did a, we made a motherboard and we tested it, and, and that, that was an infringing use, right? And those kinds of things seem like that those are at least one step further down the causal yeah. chain. And, you know, those are things that I think are more um, vulnerable to attack under footnote three. So that's pretty much the Marvell case. So Marvell, maybe, maybe Marvell loses on the, the grounds that they had before that as a general matter, 271A no longer, uh, 271A is connected to the remedies provision so that we have potential extraterritorial damages. But in that particular situation, um, there's not proximate cause. I think that's right. I mean, and it's not just international context where you have harm to a patent holder that falls outside the scope of the patent. You have the same thing when you have complementary goods sales that are lost as a result of the infringement. And the Federal Circuit's already dealt with that, and they use proximate cause under right height as the way to cut that off. And so, um, Getting back to the, the elephant analogy, um, it's not just an international issue. You have this issue sort of, of uh, you know, across patent damages in general, which is you know, how far do you look from the act of infringement to your theory of recovery? But then, I mean, the problem with the way the right high case is and the current view of proximate cause in the Federal Circuit is, I think right now all we're looking at is foreseeability. Reasonable foreseeability, yeah, and and that's that standard shouldn't be applied in patent cases. Because, um, yeah. But I mean, that is the current Federal Circuit law, and if anyone's ever <laughs> planning to challenge that. You have two people here that would love to yeah, work on that. Yeah. I mean, so because under the foreseeability standard, right, pretty much anything that we said would still be uh, uh, cause, pro we would say there's approximate cause. It's pretty foreseeable that a, anything in your lab leads eventually to sales anywhere in the world, right? Well, there might be some sales that like, oh, we, d we had no idea it could be used for that. I mean, it, w it would do some work in some cases, but... But, but the rare, it, I think yeah. it's a rare piece right now. If foreseeability is the... Uh, it has to be something more than just foreseeability there. I agree. I think we just have a few minutes left here. I'd like to open this now to questions from the audience. Was there a parallel foreign case and uh, was there, a, uh, I don't know what market particularly there were the largest number of sales of the combined product, uh, but was there a foreign par parallel case or a foreign patent and or was there a double damages scenario that was at play? Well, there's no patent office in the high seas, which makes this tricky because the infringement was taking place in international waters. So it's a gap of coverage is part of the problem. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to take a step back, some of the, uh, some of the, the acts, if not if not all of them that were accused, actually happened in like the the EEZ that that is the, the I forget exactly what that stands for, but like the exclusive the, economic zone. Yeah, yeah, exclusive economic zone of the United States. And there, there's actually an argument to be made that that should be considered the United States. Um, that issue didn't didn't get to the Supreme Court. Uh, but if you assume that that's not part of the United States, then that means that yes, it was in international water and. You know, there were arguments that Ion made about, well, look at the, the flag of the, the, um, of the, the carrier, uh, the, the, that is, you know, what nations ship. Uh, because what, what the system was or, or is are these seismic streamers that will be miles in length that then are, are used to uh, uh, send uh, sound waves down to the bottom of the ocean, through the bottom of the ocean, and then basically take a picture. And that's where the, the, so the infringement's all happening out, uh, excuse me, the, the use of the system is all happening out on, uh, on the ocean. And to be clear, oh, sorry. Is that how a regional, had it been a more conventional product combined in France, for example, if it was a panel of three on whether there would be a parallel case that could uh, get double damages on a French patent lawsuit that could get damages in France also, for example? 
Well, that would depend on French law, right? I mean, so, if, yeah, well, so, I mean, <laughs> if you get U.S. patent damages, and then the question is, would France say, you know, we're going to apply some kind of international exhaustion rule that once you've paid U.S. damages for the upstream product, you can't collect again in France? That's the rule we would apply here in the U.S., sure it appears. I'm not sure the question is asking uh, the double recovery question or simply just is there a potential alternative remedy for a patent in a different country? Well, there certainly is an alternative remedy in another country. The question is, let's just say the French case happened first. Oh, okay. That's exa I think that's the exhaustion situation. Well, no, but if they, go, if they sue the downstream person first, oh, that's, that's, no, that's an interesting, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. There's the, uh, just to add to this, there's yeah. the, a rule of 100% recovery. The, there's a rule of 100% recovery in the U.S., right? If you sue, I don't think it's quite exhaustion, but if you sue the distributor, the retailer, et cetera, you can sue whoever you want, and they're responsible for 100% damages, but um, you, can't, you can't get more than 100%. And so I take the question to be, does, would that also apply if the uh, second case is in a foreign jurisdiction? Because in your scenario, that's all U.S. And you're asking if that 100% recovery rule would extend into the into a cross-border issue now that we can extend patent damages. Cross yeah, it certainly seems like it should, right? Or you could argue it's a kind of offsetting benefit, like, oh, yeah, yeah we infringed your patent, we oppose these losses, but on the upside, you got paid this much by a French patent court. Sure. I mean, I, I don't know the... I don't think, I don't think have, there is a don't, don't have an answer yeah, to yeah. that, but I mean, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Any more questions? I have one final question just to fill in the last minute so we all get our CLE. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how does the Halo Electronics case figure into this overall picture? They refer to it in the syllabus of the, uh, of the opinion. That Halo Electronics was a case that we discussed in some detail here. I think it figures uh, only procedurally, right? John? This yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the Halo doesn't f uh, factor into this case in particular, except for the path that this case took in order to get to the Supreme Court a second time. That is, uh, the, after uh, the case was decided in the Federal Circuit, we filed a, a cert petition presenting the same issue uh, that was ultimately taken in this case uh, but presenting a, a second question, which was, you know, should the court grant vac vacate and remand in light of in light of Halo, because there was a, a willfulness issue in the case as well. Uh, the first uh, the first go around, the court took us up on the second question, uh, granted, vacated, remanded, and sent back uh, on on Halo grounds, and then part of the case was remanded to uh, to address those issues. Um, the, the Federal Circuit wrote a second opinion on remand. We filed a second cert petition, now just presenting uh, the issue that was decided by the, the Supreme Court in this case, and it was taken by the court on the, the second cert petition. So then I, I, I just curious, when was this case originally filed? Ooh, uh, I <laughs> want to think um, maybe 2012, okay. uh, or is that when it went to trial? Uh, <laughs> 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 I've lost track. Uh, right. It's been pending for a while. <laughs> and the other, since we have one minute, the other pr interesting procedural twist is that some of these claims have since been invalidated in IPR, which poses this question, which is now bubbling up, which is, well, how do we think about once damages have been assessed in the district court, and then later IPR knocks some of those out? You know, what's what's? How do we do? We need to refactor damages, and that's currently an issue active being discussed in the federal circuit, as I understand it. That's right. So. Okay, on that note, yeah. we're out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists. I'll bring my banana back. <laughs> That's very Okay, we will switch right into the second case the Supreme Court decided last term. Uh, it's a case that uh, many people were holding their breath to, to hear what the Supreme Court would do. Uh, oil States versus Green Energy Group. Uh, so we can have the speakers take their seats. The uh, CLE session code is still the same, so there's nothing else to write down.
Yes, Robert Surratt is a partner at McAndrews, and he is moderating uh, this session. Great. Well, good morning. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Krent, uh, Professor Lee, and the rest of the Chicago Kent community for uh, having me back. You know, I graduated here in 97, and it's, it's been a wonderful uh, to watch this program grow, this, this IP uh, program here. So thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce our panel. Uh, I've got to my left George Quillen. He's a partner at Foley and Laudner, and he was counsel to Green's Energy Group. Uh, next to him, I've got Professor Tejas Narachanya from UC Berkeley School of Law. Next to him, uh, Ruth Ann Deutsch, founding partner of Deutsch Hunt and counsel to Amiki Curiae 3M Company at all in the case, and uh, Professor Greg Riley uh, at the end uh, from Chicago Kent. As, as Professor Lee said, this was one of the most anticipated and closely followed patent cases in recent memory. The America Invents Act of 2011 created in a parties review IPRs, a new adversarial administrative proceeding by which the PTO's Patent Trial and Appeal Board, or PTAB, can review and cancel issued patents. Oil states alleged that the PTAB's cancellation of its patent violated Article III's guarantee of an impartial judiciary and the Seventh Amendment's guarantee of trial by jury. The Supreme Court rejected that challenge, holding that patent rights were public rights created by and subject to the conditions imposed by Congress, including cancellation by an administrative agency lacking Article III protection. The court, the court further held that the Seventh Amendment is inapplicable when an issue can properly be assigned to an administrative agency for resolution. So the first question I'll throw out to the panel is, beyond just the parties in the case and perhaps IP lawyers, who are the winners and losers from the court's decision upholding the IPR process? Well, law professors won. They, got, <laughs> they still got something to teach. Yeah. The, the PTAB judges won. They, they, they still got a job, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could look at the uh, list of the amici. There were 58 amicus briefs, so the, well, those that uh, filed on behalf of uh, oil states, you could think of them as losers. Um, but uh, uh, I'll let the others respond. And, and along with that, are there particular entity, entities or industries that are happy about the decision? I mean, I, I would leave the, the industry's question, I think, to to the lawyers, I'd be really interested to hear how they think this shakes out. Um, I suppose it probably shakes out along sort of traditional uh, infringer versus patentee lines, but I, I'd love to know if there's more nuance to that. I think that the, the entities that win are the, the PTO, Congress, the entities that had stakes in AI, AIA and the IPR process. But beyond that, it's, I think it's sort of hard to think about in the abstract who wins or loses by, by this one decision. I'm not going to tread into the industry's landmine. <laughs> sure. um, uh, but I also think that it, it's a win for the administrative yeah. state and the administrative adjudicatory process more broadly because the argument uh, made by oil states, as Justice Breyer pointed out during the oil argument, could have stretched to, to cover cases of under you know FAA adjudication, when a passenger loses her umbrella, which is you know a piece of private property on an airline, and and the case is adjudicated you know by an FAA board. So, in that sense, um, you know, a, the a wave of Supreme Court jurisprudence that's very protective of judicial authority in Article Three, you know, there was a, a line drawn um, that I think was an important one. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, kind of looking at this at a bigger picture issue, one of the big winners here is Congress and or people who are interested in uh, patent reform or reforms to the patent system. I'd caution, I mean, certainly in the short term, people who associate themselves with patent holder interests, patentee interests, would see this as a loss because the PTAB has generally been seen as hostile uh, to, to patent owners. 
However, the winds are already changing there. The director is implementing new procedures that, that uh, make, might make, as we'll talk about this afternoon, that might change there. And if you look at the long history, patent policy debates tend to go back and forth uh, between favoring those who are, are favoring, if you will, uh, competitors and patent owners. And so in the short term, holding up, uh, upholding the PTAB might be bad for patent owners. In the long term, there's uh, reforms to uh, the, the emphasis on Congress's power over the patent system and the ability to implement new changes to the patent system and not to be bound by history and to condition patent rights and all that could end up uh, being beneficial to patent owners. You already see some arguments out there. Uh, Professor Paul Janicki had a post on Patent Leo uh, recently about making patents incontestable over a certain number of years. And the court's emphasis that longstanding historical practice doesn't limit Congress's power would support that type of change, whereas an argument that Congress couldn't create the PTAB today because they hadn't done it in the past would prevent other substantial changes that could benefit patent owners in the future uh, by kind of constraining Congress's power to change the patent system to changing times. Great, thanks. So let's move to the substance, a little bit of the opinion. The Supreme Court characterized patent validity as a public right. So do you agree with the court's conclusion? And if so, why or why not? For sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> as, a, as a patent lawyer, you know, patent lawyers are, are wont to say that uh, patents are special. Um, now, the, there's sort of a long arc of Supreme Court decisions uh, reminding the, the Federal Circuit and the bar that, uh, well, they're may not be as quite as special as patent lawyers want them to be. But they're different. There's, there's no notion of, uh, of uh, fee simple absolute in, in the context of, of patent law. Trademarks last potentially forever. Not that way with patents. They're, they're, very, they're very different. And what's going on here, in this situation anyway, in, the, in, in this very case, isn't that property of one entity is being taken from it, it's that the property that belonged to the public is being restored to the public. It never belonged, never should have belonged to oil states. Um, yeah, I, I, so I, I also fall on the public right side of the line. I think the court got this one right. Um, I think it's this is routinely true for the sorts of administrative grants that a patent represents. You know, this is what you know, the court has, the court has referred to patents as administrative grants several times before, before oil states. And it's true for grants, it's true for other sorts of monetary benefits, it's true for other things, rights, mm -hmm. like spectrum rights, for example, that the government grants. Um, and so I think characterizing it as a public right is, is exactly right. Um, now having said that, I wish that the court had said a little bit more about public rights. So. You know, the, the, the court sort of engages in the standard trick of, you know, we have public rights on the one side and private rights on the other side, and the line between them is tricky, but this is so far on the public rights side that we really don't need to re-examine all of our jurisprudence about the distinction between public and private rights. Uh, but I actually wish that the court would have told us more about what makes something a public right and what makes something a private right, because this is an area of the law that uh, is murky, is not clear, it has sort of gone back and forth over the years. Um, and I think it's something that if we had more clarity, we would have more answers on some of the issues that are coming up right now. So for example, in, um, in St. Regis and in the, uh, in the Erickson case and the, the University of Minnesota case, I think there's a reason to think that the distinction between, or the way we think about public versus private rights might matter for sovereign immunity, uh, sovereign immunity questions. Uh, so having more information from the court about what exactly the contours of this right right is would, would help us think about that, but unfortunately, we don't get it. Though, though I mean, I, I think part of the problem with this case, so, so one of the problems is that people treat public and private right as if they have some sort of inherent meaning, and because patents are described as private property frequently, therefore they must be private rights. Public rights and private rights, they have, they're, they're terms of art. They're terms of art in the Article Three context and can only be understood by looking at the court's Article Three case law. And I think, frankly, and I mean, I wrote an article before cert was granted here saying that there's no reason that this issue keeps coming up, but it's but there's no reason for the court to take it because these so fall, clearly fall on the public rights case that I think actually this was a bad vehicle to 
clarify the public private rights thing because by any characterization of it, as you see with the, the short concurrence versus the majority, these fall on the public rights side. Well, we wrote a brief arguing the opposite. So, I mean, there, there are strong arguments the other way. And, um, you know, the, not only Justice Gorsuch, but, but the chief agreed with those arguments. Um, I think the, it, some of it boils down to what um, patents were in the past and how they evolved. Um, and in, in, the, in the dissent, I thought, you know, one of the most persuasive points made were that the um, franchise cases that the majority relied upon to say that these were public rights and, you know, patents were basically gifts from a monarch to someone to have the right to, you know, run a toll road or, uh, you know, use something, you know, and it's just by, by, by largesse that the idea of a patent over time, and certainly by the time the clause was written into the Constitution, reflected much more uh, a patent as um, the right that you get for your creative and useful contribution to science and the arts. And so if you think of a patent as something that you've earned and created, then it becomes much more like a private right, or a, a certainly a private property, which I think no one in the court um, went so far as to say it's not a private property right, and they can't because it is, obviously, and there are lots of cases that say the question is how many sticks in that bundle um, and whether the government can limit them. Uh, but I lost the, the next... Can I, can I make yeah. a point and then you... Uh, yeah. So I think, I think we actually 100% agree. I don't think actually the dis disagreement between the majority and the dissent is about the public rights, private rights doctrine. I think it's a debate about what are the nature of patent rights and, uh, and what fixes uh, uh, the nature of patent rights. And, and where, I, where I disagree with you in the dissent, I think, is that this concept of patent rights as the property, as, as reflecting you know, uh, 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 the inviolable property of the patent owner, that was very much in flux in the late uh, uh, 18th century, which is the crucial time for kind of an originalist idea. And really, if you look at most of the cases cited by the briefing, you're looking at 1810, 1850, and 15 and on into the 19th century. And so by the middle of the 19th century, was, this concept of patents was very established. But the real question is, what is the fact that this concept was established in the mid-19th century? How, what's the theory for limiting Congress today? No, I agree, and, and, and the broader question is, it, is, is it a sort of Blackstonian thing that, you know, once you've invented and you get your patent, it's forever inviolable, or is it something that the government can come back and correct, and, and is there a history of the government recognizing that there can be errors and those are correctable, and if it's, and I, you know, the opinion begins and the argument began with you know, a recognition and a concession by oil states council that, you know, other corrective mechanisms from the agency were okay. And so once this became something that is on the correction side of the line, as opposed to the adjudicating, a, you know, fixed inviolate right side of the line, I think the case was over. Let's stay a little bit on the dissent then. So. Justice Gorsuch's dissent puts significant emphasis on the historical treatment of patents as subject to cancellation only in courts. And the question is, is Justice Gorsuch's description of the historical treatment accurate? And if so, what significance should that historical practice have in determining the constitutionality of IPRs? Well, I think it's accurate enough. It just it puts emphasis or attaches importance to different things. Um, different aspects of it and, and, and reads the consequences in a different way. Um, it's not quite the same thing, but if, um, if we were to say that uh, a U.S. District Court in, pick a state, uh, Montana or Vermont, hadn't adjudicated a patent infringement case in X number of years, does that mean it no longer has the power to do that? I don't think we would say that under, under, our, under our situation. Um, so similarly, when you're looking back in the 18th century to what the Privy Council was doing and the fact that they did do something or didn't actually do something uh, to Justice Gorsuch, it seems to make a difference whether they exercised whatever power it was they had as a, as a, as a customary thing or instead 
um, as, as uh, Greens argued, and uh, that the Privy Council had the power, and that was enough, that they had the power. Um, and it's just curious to me uh, that uh, part of this is parsing whether the Privy Council was it's interesting because I don't know that a lot of Americans distinguish very clearly what's going on in, in that part of the world. We, I, for example, think of it as, as British. So there's the British Privy Council. Well, as Justice Gorsuch points out, there's a, there may be a difference between what the Privy Council was doing with English things as distinguished from what it was doing with Scottish things. Um, and and uh, that, that made a difference to Justice Gorsuch. So I, I, I'm not a historian. I didn't live through the period. So I have no idea whether what Justice Gorsuch wrote as what he described as historical treatment, whether that's accurate or not. Um, and I don't want to say that it is or isn't. Um, but the second question is the more important one, I think, which is what, how important is this historical practice? Um, how much should it determine the scope of the constitutionality of IPR today? And my view is that little, little to none. Um, I mean, so, so imagine that Congress had called this something entirely different rather than patents and had called this thing widgets. Now all of a sudden, does that mean that the historical practice related to patents is relevant or irrelevant? Because now we have an entire species of things. And it's worth thinking about that, I think, in the context of the AIA, and this relates to something, Greg, you mentioned about sort of shifting the focus from Article Three to the power of Congress. And I actually think that's the question that's at issue here. So, you know, what we get from Justice Gorsuch's dissent and what we get from Justice Thomas's opinion is a description of a patent system that is changing over time, that is responsive to changing economic conditions, um, that seems like it's at an inflection point at a particularly important, coincidentally at a particularly important period for um, original public meaning, originalism. Um, so. If, in fact, what, what we have is a, a patent system that is one that is responsive to changing economic conditions at this important moment in time, then the question is actually not what's the scope of Article 3, but what's the scope of Congress's power under Article 1, under the IP clause, to craft rights that secure to inventors and artists for a limited time uh, you know, the rights in their, invention, their inventions and works, but maybe subject to correction, or maybe subject to administrative correction, or subject to further control by Congress or by the executive. And there's nothing at all that I can see in Article One or in that practice that suggests that Congress doesn't have that power. And it shouldn't matter whether we call those things that are granted patents or widgets or something else entirely, because I think it falls fully within the scope of what Congress is allowed to do. Uh, so I think, um, I think two points. So I think I largely agree with the one exception of conflating thing case law from the 1810s and 1820s as reflecting the framers intent or originalist sounding arguments which I, I think is flawed as a general matter I think that uh, Justice Gorsuch there's not a problem with Justice Gorsuch's uh, uh, history it's a problem of what to make of it and maybe to at this point I'm going to disagree with myself from earlier where which you know classic professor move um, which is uh, uh, where I said that, oh, this wasn't the right case to clarify the public-private uh, distinction, et cetera. Part of the problem is we just don't know what the role of history, it's uncertain what the role of history is in the Article Three public rights context. We know very clearly what it is uh, uh, in the Seventh Amendment context, which is a, 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 a clearly historical test. But there's references in the Article Three test to determining whether something was uh, traditionally, I think that's the word, traditionally, a matter traditionally decided by its nature at, uh, at, by courts in, in 1789. And there's a lot that goes into that. What does that mean? What does it mean to be traditionally? Sure, the Privy, the Privy Council was very, uh, 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 had a very small role in the late uh, 18th century, or almost no role, but the power was still there, and it still occasionally was uh, 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 acted, even if it didn't decide. So is that enough, or are we looking for common practice? Similarly, uh, it's actually correct that from, uh, from the founding until 1952, there was, uh, the, the, there was no administrative cancellation of issued patents. However, there's other examples uh, under the 1832 Patent Act, I think it is, foreign inventors, patent rights were automatically canceled without judicial action. They were automatically uh, canceled without any action. 
uh, if the foreign inventor didn't, uh, uh, I think, become a citizen within two years and commercialize the invention in the U.S. So there are like these small examples of where Congress used its power to subject pa issued patents to cancellation without judicial action. Is that enough? And that's where this idea that maybe we do, it would have benefited from more guidance on the public-private rights thing. But it's kind of circular, right? Because all your examples are statu you know, mm -hmm. because of statutes. And the whole point of the majority is that the statutory terms define the scope of the right. So it, it's not like there's this, pre, that this patent right that exists without a government in the way that there's a land right that exists, or a, you know, it, it, it's very, it doesn't make sense, I think, to, to look to this past practice that's governed by statutory schemes. And that's why the, there was the debate about the McCormick case in the, in the, and the, how important that was in the decision as well and that argument, because the government and oil states read that as a case involving the patent statute at the time, and Justice Gorsuch and others said, no, this was an Article Three case, and it's both. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely right. One of the problems here is we now, I mean, this is now going to like implications beyond patent law too. Patent law was one of our more earliest significant statutory schemes, and to try to compare it to what was happening as a matter of common law and in, in, in common law jurisprudence is, is problematic. So, I, so I, I've said that I think that this, this, the constitutional standard for the, the baseline of the patent right then is whatever Congress needs to do in response to changing economic conditions. Do you think it's something else? So do you think there's something else that, that there's a, a bare constitutional minimum that... Uh, no, I'm actually writing a paper right now called okay. Against Patent Essentialism that basically says, no, that, 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 I mean, and there's examples in the first 50 years of things like the very first uh, in the, uh, the Senate in the Patent Act of 1790 debate proposed uh, mandatory compulsory licensing if the product wasn't introduced at a reasonable price. Working requirements were imposed on foreign inventors. I think there's uh, uh, a lot of different things Congress could do with patent rights subject only to the constitutional ceiling that you can't expand patent rights to, say, non-novel uh, non things that aren't uh, things. But that probably brings us to what you want to get to next, which is are there other constitutional limits yes. beyond Article Three? So are there? <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, I guess uh, nobody disputes that there are due process limits on, um, on the, the nature of the administrative procedures. So somebody can, the government can't arbitrarily and capriciously, you know, and, and uh, in violation of procedural due process norms, so notice an opportunity to be heard, all of that, take away your patent. Um, and say it's invalid. And I guess it's an open question that has been hinted at in the Horn case, and there's been scholarship on it by Adam Massoff, the, the reach of the takings clause um, with respect to a patent. And I, you know, I guess we'll talk about it in one of the, the following panels. I think there's some cert petitions pending on that. Um, but like the Western GECO case, um, you know, Justice Thomas wrote this decision and it was, announced uh, to be a very narrow decision and expressly carved out those issues. So where do we see the next challenge coming from? Is it the takings clause? Is it due process clause? Retroactive application of an parties review? Which one has the best chance of winning, if any? Oh, those are different questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which um, I mean, well, they're already, all three are, mm -hmm. are percolating. I, I would think the retroactive for me would be one that maybe is, is a little easier to get there just because it, it's, it's not as broad a reach. And, um, you know, there was a, a briefing and certainly concern from even the justices in the majority during the case about what do you do with someone who um, has, you know, invested a lot of money in reliance on a, a, pallet, a patent that, you know, was issued before these procedures were announced and, you know, is invalidated under these procedures. And, you know, so there's concern. Uh, and I, I think it wouldn't be as intrusive a move by the court to go there. So. Well, what you do is, what that company does is continue to do what it's done. It continues to exploit its investment. As we all know, having a patent, having one's own patent gives you no right to practice that invention. 
patent gives you the right to exclude. If, if a company has invested all this money in, in Justice Breyer's uh, hypothetical, what happens if the patent gets taken away? Well, you continue to make your number two you pencil. You have to you, compete. You, you, can t you have to compete. What's wrong with that? Um, um, that's, it seems to me, that's not, I mean, maybe that's, maybe I'm not understanding what the Supreme <laughs> Court saw, but um, to me that was, that was an odd question. You, you can continue to do what, you, what you're doing. Um, and, and the notion about um, well, McCormick and, McCormick can't have meant what it said. McCormick says, you know, you, once the patent issues, it's out of the control of the patent office. You know, you, you can't annul it, you can't do the, you can't correct it. You can't correct it. Certificates of correction are unconstitutional. Reissue practice is unconstitutional. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. So, uh, okay. No, go ahead. Uh, so the one that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical about a lot of these constitutional challenges. The one that has kind of been out there, so the, the, let's take due process. I mean, the process due is not what people, like a, a lot of things is being thrown into the due process clause. Like I, I saw arguments that the PTAB is denying due process because it doesn't allow the discovery of district court litigation, that uh, allowed in district court litigation. That has nothing to do with the due process clause's requirements of notice and opportunity before an impartial decision maker. The one that I actually were, or I don't know if worry is the right word, but I think could have a little bit of, tra of traction is the um, PTAB judges. The PTAB judges don't have the statutory protections of employment of ALJs. Uh, ALJ, administrative law judges traditionally have statutory protections roughly con comparable to tenure for a, uh, for a professor. For now. For now, right, right. And that, that there's, there's crosswinds here. Uh, whereas the APJs of the patent office, in theory, are subject to the director's control in terms of their salary, their uh, uh, employment status, et cetera. And that gives me a little concern on the impartial decision maker prong of due process. I don't think ultimately that would be successful um, because I don't, uh, 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 but, but I think that is the one where I see actually a little bit of foothold when you compare the administrative patent judges and their, their impartiality uh, as compared, their their potential for for partiality, uh, not that they are not not that they are not impartial, but just the potentials there as compared to uh, administrative law judges. I'm not saying it's going to work, but I think there's something there. It's I want to react to the the retroactivity challenge because I think I think that that's the one that I've heard people get the most excited about. Um, but I'm, I'm skeptical about it, and the reason I'm skeptical about it is for the, the, the reason you offered before. That, so who wins in this case was the administrative state generally. And it's hard for me to imagine the court saying that, the, that we're going to freeze in time the procedures that are required every time a public grant is issued, because the scope of that would be so large. So for every EPA permit or waiver, now, all of a sudden, the EPA has to have different tracks every time for a permit renewal or a waiver renewal, depending on when the original permit or waiver was granted, because it can't change its procedures going forward, right. given that. So uh, that just seems, if that's, if that's in fact what the, retroactive, the, the substance of the retroactivity challenge is, which is how I understand it, that just seems wild to me that the court would require now all of these agencies to have separate tracks created for all of these things that they're it's, issuing. Yeah, especially because it's not changing the underlying right. substantive right. rules for what, uh, you know, makes something valid or invalid. And, you know, Malcolm Stewart during the argument gave a great example in the employment context where you have um, a due process right to a fair hearing before, if you're a federal employee, before, you know, you're, you're fired, but, it, it can't be that if the government changes the way it monitors employees, that that, that somehow affects yeah. the nature of the underlying right. Yeah. So. And there are other examples of, um, in the patent context, of the patent office uh, um, affecting the patent once it's issued. So it, although the IPRs, were new. There were other proceedings where the patent office had the power to sort of reach out and touch an issued patent. Ex parte re-exam been around since the 80s. 
Um, and they were the first questions at, at argument and are the first recitations in the opinion. I mean, it's clearly the court is seeing this as a, a line of uh, administrative authority to correct issued patents as opposed to a usurpation of Article Three power. Um, right, and 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 uh, the re-exam back then, you know, started in the '80s, and that was ex parte, right? An ex parte re-exam. So maybe that makes a difference. Well, there there were contested cases in the patent office before that. Interference practice didn't happen a whole lot, but that was clearly a, a power that the patent office had to reach out and grab an issued patent and kill the claims, kill the patent. So as a society, we've been dealing with these sorts of things for a long time. Um, it, it's, not, it's not such an innovation having, uh, having the IPRs. Well, in our last uh, couple minutes, I'd like to open it up to the audience for any questions you might have. I think we need a mic there, please. But one of the differences between the administrative uh, invalidation of patents now and the court process is the use of the broadest reasonable interpretation uh, by the patent office in interpreting claims. So here we have two separate processes which use entirely different standards, and they are entirely different, for interpreting the words of the claim when deciding when a patent is valid or not. And um, this conflict seems to me to provide uh, some uh, cause for thought as to how we've allowed this to happen. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think, let's just distinguish two questions. I think your question is on the policy question here. There's the difference between power and policy. Just because Congress made bad policy doesn't mean it lack. Congress has ultimate power to make bad policy and does so all the time, right? So the, the fact that Congress made a bad policy decision doesn't mean that Congress doesn't have the power to do it. And a lot of the arguments in oil states were policy, question, uh, policy arguments dressed up in power arguments, trying to, to shoehorn policy arguments into power. Just because this is bad, therefore it must be beyond Congress's power. So Congress has the power to set the, or, I mean, or delegate it to the patent office, to set the standards for claim construction, uh, uh, just like it has the powers to set the burdens of proof, and, and we see that all the time. So. Is that good or bad policy? Uh, I mean, it depends on, on where you look. There's overlapping proceedings, sure, but the exact reason that Congress created the AIA was because it didn't think that litigation was effectively uh, doing the job to separate out those patents that were problematic from those that weren't. I actually don't have strong policy views one way or the other on it, so I'll leave it to others on it, but I do want to just emphasize that's a, uh, uh, that's a question of policy, not power. I think it's it's um, problematic when you have parallel court and agency proceedings that are using different standards, um, and you get into all sorts of um, you know Gordian knots or endless loops about timing and estoppel and things that would go would be less problematic if they were applying the same standard. And I and the PTO I understand is in the process of uh, looking at this and it, you know. The only reason I can think that they would look at it, given that. Well, the the in, in the conflict, yeah. But <coughs> it's not that long. It's not that long standing because none of or this is. Oh, well, I meant in in the IPR well, process. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, there, so this is this is just a re, there was a debate about this uh, with reexamination in the 1980s as to whether to extend, extend BRI into uh, reexam, right? And that kind of Federal Circuit kind of resolved this. And now, as we go to a new procedure, the the argument of is this more like litigation? Is this more like examination? And how does that apply? Kind of has come back up again, I think. So it's like one of these issues that keeps popping up as new procedures. We are out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists and our audience for uh, participating. Thank you. Okay, we're going to switch.
uh, to the third case of the Supreme Court decided SAS Institute. Uh, as our panelists make their way to the stage, uh, someone asked me about CLE credit from another state. Uh, you fill out the same form uh, as the Illinois uh, bar members and do the same process and a universal certificate will be emailed to you uh, next week from our CLE office here. Okay, so just do the same thing as everybody else is doing if you're seeking CLE from an, another state. Okay, so uh, our... Our next case, SAS Institute produced an interesting five to four split among the justices that we normally don't see in IP cases. Our moderator for this session is Grantland Drutchess. He is a partner at McDonald, Bain and Hulbert, and Berghoff. All right, and I'd like to start just by introducing the panelists. Gregory Castanius, I'm sorry. That's all uh, right. Partner Jones Day, counsel to SAS Institute. Thank you. In addition, we have Professor Artie Rye of Duke Law School and Professor Sarab Vishnubhat, of uh, Texas A&M University School of Law. And with this last case, uh, also dealing with IPR proceedings, the issue in, in SAS Institute was really whether the PTAB's regulation allowing the PTAB to institute partial, uh, institute IPRs based on some but not all claims uh, of, of the uh, petition is really, really the focus. In a five to four opinion written by Justice Gorsuch, the Supreme Court found that the plain text of the statute prohibited such partial institutions. Instead, Section 318, uh, by its plain language, requires that the PTAB must institute, quote, a final written decision with respect to the patentability of any patent claim challenged by the petitioner, end quote. It's not clear that the Federal Circuit below ever really addressed this plain language of Section 318. The court concluded that the, that the AIA created a party-directed proceeding along the lines of district court litigation rather than an inquisitorial uh, patent office-directed proceeding along the lines of ex parte and inter parties re-examinations. And also, in light of what it found to be the clear statutory text, it, uh, it found that the administrative deference principles of Chevron were simply inapplicable. The majority, again, five conservative justices, found that the final written decision on any challenged claim language of the statute clearly foreclosed partial institution. As Justice Gorsuch noted, in this context, as in so many others, any means every. The agency cannot curate the claims at issue, but must decide them all. Justice Breyer, on, on the other hand, was joined by three liberal justices in dissent. Justice Breyer contended that the structure of the statute and the placement of Section 318 within the statute made it ambiguous as to whether the provision referred to all claims challenged in the petition or all claims challenged in the instituted proceeding. This ended up being sort of an unusual breakdown where you have a patent issue that breaks down along the lines of conservative versus liberal lines. And this uh, a case in general leaves open a lot of questions which you have this panel to answer uh, for. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip Greg because of his obvious, uh, obvious bias, albeit <laughs> slight in favor of SAS. But I'd like to ask the professors, who, who had the better statutory interpretation argument uh, uh, in your view and why did the case break down five to four along conservative liberal lines? <laughs> Uh, just a, a you, you, you can respond. I'll let you respond. All right. Uh, so I'll, I'll go first because yeah. um, just because of where I am in the order. Uh, so I like this case because it's a genuinely hard case. It seems to me. I think the policy arguments in particular are genuinely hard. And I know you asked about statutory interpretation, so um, we'll leave aside policy for a moment. At the end of the day, I think I would favor Justice Breyer's view on statutory interpretation. And that's not because of the statutory interpretation question per se, but because of the administrative law gloss that I would put on the statutory interpretation question. So if this had been a situation where the agency was not in the picture, 
I would be leaning straight up um, because I think as a de novo matter, it's unclear. But I do think that clarity at step one of Chevron requires something different than does ordinary statutory interpretation. In my view, at least, I teach administrative law, so this is what I tell my students. Clarity at step one, because there is a gloss in the whole Chevron framework of deference to the agency, should require, in my view, again, judges to be, and I even throw out a percentage, you know, think they have an 80% likelihood of clarity, as opposed to 51%. And I think that, for example, if clarity, if they think that they are only 60% confident of clarity, they should defer to the agency. If that's ambiguity for purposes of step one. Now, that's just my position, and there's no right answer as a legal matter. There are lots of commentators and judges who would disagree with me. And I think that goes to part of the reason for the 5-4 split. I think in general, recently, not in the 80s when Justice Scalia really was a big fan of Chevron, but more recently through the 90s and the aughts and now, it's tended to be the case that those on the conservative, if you want to use crude terms like that, um, side of the spectrum, think that either one can stop at step one because judges should use every means of statutory interpretation and every tool available to them to get to 80%, or they think that getting 60% is fine, or in the case of Justice Gorsuch, it's pretty clear, he didn't even mention Chevron until the very end. He said, oh yes, and there's Chevron. Um, that Chevron, and he's, as a uh, lower court justice, he was very clear about this, that Chevron is a very suspect framework in the first instance. And I think Justice Roberts, probably Justice Thomas, although it's a little less clear, and possibly Justice Kavanaugh, or Judge Kavanaugh, if he gets on the court, are all very much, we almost always find clarity at step one people. Um, whereas it turns out, for a variety of reasons that we can get into, if interesting um, to the audience, um, the liberal justice tend to favor more deference to the administrative state. Saru, any thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think it's worth pointing out that the, the Federal Circuit decision in this did uh, engage in a statutory construction, not exactly the same statutory construction the Supreme Court did, and said that, well, look, it, uh, it says in Section 314A uh, that the, the claims that we're talking about, uh, that's, you know, sort of worded differently than uh, the the reference to claims in Section 318A. So 314A talks about uh, claims that are challenged in the petition, and uh, 318A talks about claims that are challenged by the petitioner. And the use of different language suggests that uh, we're, we're talking about something different and that that is enough ambiguity into which we can pour the content of Chevron. Uh, I think that that sort of falls short of the rest of the text of 318A, right? I teach civil procedure, and the first thing I tell my students when you're reading uh, text is keep reading. Um, because the, uh, the language challenged by the petitioner in 318A is intended, I think, to distinguish it from claims added by the patent owner, which is exactly what the, the next phrase in 318A is. So it's not just the stuff that is uh, challenged by the petitioner in the petition that has to be addressed in the final written decision, but also the final written decision has to address the new stuff that the patent owner added, uh, you know, in one of the sort of rare cases when an amendment might be permitted. So there is ambiguity in the statute, but I don't think the ambiguity gets us where we need to go if what we want is uh, Justice Breyer's outcome. Because the statute, 314A says, shall not institute unless. So it's a necessary condition. It's ambiguous whether or not it's a sufficient condition. So there is no doubt there is an ambiguity there. But whether that ambiguity goes to the question of the final obligation of reasoned decision-making the agency has in 318A uh, is, uh, I think, at least clear uh, enough that you could, I'm not sure it gets to 80%, but uh, uh, it, it, it's certainly more clear than I've seen in uh, in, in other situations, even within the IPR statute. Now, to your, your initial question, why did this break down 5-4? I think it was absolutely Chevron. Um, I think it was very much a proxy fight for Chevron. You can see that 
in Justice Kagan joining everything except part 3A of Justice Breyer's dissent, in which he talks about a very, uh, you know, sort of freer form, uh, open-ended approach to Chevron, where I think Justice Kagan is probably uh, a little more uh, formal in her in her approach to that you know, step one, step two, step zero, God forbid. And so we uh, we, we see this uh, this five four split for that reason. Greg, I think you've been containing yourself on the ambiguity <laughs> issue, uh, but also the Chevron issue. Would you like to address? Well, let me start by saying that there's a reason that we, for your observation that you know, we don't usually see five to four decisions in patent cases because this wasn't a patent case. We never presented it to the court as a patent case, and in fact, that was <coughs> very much our strategy with regard to certiorari. Um, you know, when we came to this case, having done our best, sh given our best shot at the federal circuit, and getting a denial of rehearing on bank, with only Judge Newman, <coughs> excuse me, filing her third dissent on this issue, first in the <laughs> synopsis case that actually made the circuit law second in our panel case where that law was followed, and third from the denial of in-bank. Uh, she kept getting more vigorous and more vigorous and more vigorous in her dissenting each time. Um, you know, as we were approaching the Supreme Court, the court had just had the, the Cuso Quazo case. By the way, thank you for uh, pronouncing our client's name correctly. It is the SAS Institute in our case. I don't know unfortunately, for Cuso or Quazo, which is the right pronunciation of that one. Um, but I will honor it if anybody will tell me. Um, the, so as we were coming to the Supreme Court, we decided, okay, we need to really re-envision this case. You know, it's not a case that's about the operation of the IPR regime. It is, but that's not what it's really about. What it's really about is what I've, I called in another article on the subject a schoolhouse rock sort of question about who gets to make the law in this country. Does, is it really the legislature, like I learned in, in grade school on schoolhouse rock? Because I don't remember anything about executive agencies on that schoolhouse rock episode. <laughs> and w when you read the statute all the way through, and, and by the way, I'm not technically trained. I was an English and philosophy major, so I deal with words and truth and proof and logic and all of those sorts of things with my training. And when you read this statute all the way through from beginning to end, the meaning to me is clear. Now, what we could have a debate, uh, and we could have it in terms of the law, we could have it in terms of analytical philosophy about what ambiguity means. And all language is inherently ambiguous. But this statute, with regard to whether or not a final written decision has to be on all claims challenged by the petitioner, or as it's used, any claim challenged by the petitioner. That's clear to us, and that was the way we presented the case. It was a case of the statutory interpretation is clear, so the Federal Circuit got that wrong. And oh, by the way, this is exactly the problem that people have been identifying about the Chevron decision. It gives too much power to the administrative agency to decide to rewrite the statute in a way that is very different than what Congress intended. You won't find the words partial institution or partial decision or anything remotely resembling that in, in the statute. When you read the language of the statute, you'll see a regime that says petitioners files a petition, selects the claims to be challenged, if in its total and unreviewable discretion, and that's quaso, the board, or the director is actually who is specified in the statute, the re regulations uh, assign that to the board to make the decision. If they find one or more claims to be possibly unpatentable, then the board, then the director may, not must, even in that case there's discretion, may institute inter partes review. That's what the one claim, or the claim by claim analysis is in the statute, and that's the only place where one claim is talked about. Otherwise, it's talking about adjudicating the petition, adjudicating the claims in the petition, adjudicating the claims selected by the petitioner. Nowhere, even in the statutory section dealing with the things that the PTAB is given administrative authority to, does it say you can select a few fewer claims. You can run things 
in a very different way than the way that we architected this. And so as we brought the case to the court, um, we brought it as effectively a, if you don't like our statutory construction, then you're going to have to confront the debate over Chevron. And lo and behold, a couple of months before the presidential election, you know, a, a judge on the Tenth Circuit had written a very compelling <laughs> concurring <laughs> opinion to his own panel opinion in a case called, uh, I believe it was Gonzalez Brizuela, was that, is that the mm -hmm. name of the case? Mm -hmm. Versus United States, an immigration case. And this very eloquent Tenth Circuit judge <laughs> raises some serious <laughs> questions about the fundamental schoolhouse rock basics of the Chevron Doctrine. Well, that got him some attention in the appellate bar and it got him on the president's shortlist. Now, the petition for rehearing before the federal circuit was denied the day before the election. Now, I, I didn't vote for the current member of the, the current inhabitant of the Oval Office, just to be clear about this. And I wasn't expecting on that Monday that he was going to be in the Oval Office. But once I shook the cobwebs from my brain and realized that one of the justices to replace Justice Scalia was going to come from that list, and that list included Judge Gorsuch from the Tenth Circuit. That began to coalesce our strategy for the cert petition. And the day we filed our cert petition, citing the Tenth Circuit case with, ju with then Judge Gorsuch's special concurrence highlighted in the Chevron section, I filed that, went home, turned on my television, and watched the president announce his candidate <laughs> at the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch. This case was pitched to this debate. And I think that the, 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 the insight uh, that this is a proxy fight for Chevron is a pretty good one. But that was the strategy that got us five to four because it allowed them to say, here's what the statute means. It's clear, and we think it's clear. And I'm, I'm, we, we probably should have a debate offline because this is a patent conference after all about whether your 80% versus 51% really should apply because isn't that really just irrigating more and more power to the agency and less and less to the legislature. Now you get, you get a second. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, no, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> agreeing. I'm agreeing with you. No, I just wanted to say but, yes. <laughs> but, but, but that is what this is about. And I think, by the way, that this is, the, in terms of if you're looking at this case as something broader than a patent case, this is how the Chevron issue is going to continue to be avoided, is by making compelling statutory interpretation arguments. You know, a lot of smart lawyers can come up with a lot of different meanings for words. 30 years in the practice of law has already taught me that. And so ambiguity is inherent everywhere on, su on some level with some meaning of that word. The question is whether judicial ambiguity exists. And I think what you see even though they didn't actually do it here, is a willingness of the court to engage more in the judge-friendly, pittston stevedoring approach to statutory interpretation in the administrative realm. And if you haven't read the pittston stevedoring case, it's a really good contrast pre-Chevron to the way that the Chevron regime has come out. Second Circuit decision cited in our briefs and repeated in Justice Gorsuch's opinion for the court. Um, you'll see, I think, where the court is heading with regard to administrative law in this area. All right. So, Ar Ar oh, so no, I just wanted to uh, vehemently to agree with you that in point of fact, <laughs> yes, um, uh, I think that the vision that I teach my students of 80% clarity does involve a core assumption of some deference to the administrative state, absolutely. And, you know, that that is where you know, the battle is pitched, as you've very eloquently said. Um, this is absolutely a shadow fight on Chevron. And one of the things that's interesting, and this is just a little bit of a side note, is I think oil states was also a shadow fight on the administrative state. And and so, and George, Justice Gorsuch's um, presence on the court, I think, led to the grant of certiorari in oil states. So, you know, there's a nice <coughs> continuing theme in these two panels. He was interestingly on the court by the time they had to vote for certiorari, uh, in our case. So oh, even that's though he, was, he yeah. was not on the court when we filed our petition, the okay. Solicitor General sought enough extensions that they got him on the court and hmm. got what they asked for, I guess. Hmm. Interesting. All right, sorry, anything? No. 
No. Okay. Um, so the next question is regarding the competing policy issues that the Supreme Court framed. First of all, the Patent Office's insistence that that this uh, that this partial institution of challenged claims ends up uh, allowing them to uh, increase efficiency of PTAB proceedings, whereas SAS argued to the opposite. It just left more to be resolved in litigation down the road. And Greg, you want to start off on this one? Well. So the court obviously says policy is for the Congress. It's a clear statute. It's, we're done. We're not doing policy. Um, but the policy debate was efficiency. And the patent office said, well, you know, it's really efficient. We can, we can adjudicate. We can get rid of more bad claims if we can limit uh, IPRs to just the claims that we want to take into consideration. And our response was, well, that may be great for you, but that doesn't really do the system any good with regard to efficiency because remember that, that validity slash patentability challenges, and I try to use my language that when you're in front of the patent office, the issue is patentability, and when you're in court, the issue is validity. I try to use those terms carefully, but ultimately they come down to the same question, is this patent claim going to be allowed to survive? And it's going to be litigated somewhere. And when the patent office is, is only taking four claims out of 10 or 10 claims out of 16, then those other claims are going to have to be litigated, assuming that the party does not think that, does not agree with the patent office's decision that there wasn't enough to initiate on. Uh, those are going to be litigated somewhere else. So the efficiency, we thought, was in sort of one-stop shopping on these the major portions of validity decisions, though, uh, obviousness and anticipation, mostly they've become the, the PTAB of obviousness, as, a, as, as I seem to read their cases. But you know, our view is that efficiency for the macro system was better served by the interpretation that was ultimately adopted, and that's that's what has prevailed. I, mean, I, I don't take any particular you know comfort in the fact that you know, our policy decision, our policy argument was the one that was, it, that was uh, adopted in effect by taking the statutory interpretation, but I do think that were you deciding this as a matter of policy, policy the macro policy, macro efficiency is better than micro, just the agency's efficiency. Saurabh, so, any thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think um, that this does promote efficiency. I mean, the, the majority did say we don't care about efficiency, um, you know, as a, as a judicial body, but um, I think it does promote efficiency and uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, on the back end, uh, you know, there's the, the sort of matter of estoppel and there's been some uh, debate in the federal circuit about what estoppel effects should apply where there has been a partial institution. Um, the word during in the, in the estoppel statute could mean everything after institution or it could mean everything from petition forward. Uh, Shaw Industries, I think, uh, did not answer that question. Um, it was a very procedurally peculiar case. There was a strong, uh, was it concurring in special part or some, some sort of weird designation for Judge Reyna's opinion, which uh, I think properly took the agency to task uh, for not being very fulsome and why it was uh, rejecting certain claims merely as redundant rather than, you know, substantively um, unlikely to, to succeed. And then there's also the question, this gets overlooked a little bit, everybody's worried about estoppel and they should be, uh, but there's also the question of judicial stays in the district court pending the outcome of the, the IPR or, or whatever. So in that situation, if there's a full denial, no estoppel effects and the district court can proceed. If there's a full institution, then there's a clear signal to the district court that something of value is likely to come from this that will bear on the decision uh, that you might make if you choose to go forward. What should you do that? What, what should you do with that information? Stay your hand, right? So what partial institution did uh, to Greg's point about the macro effect on the system is it simply took a what could have been a clear signal and muddled it, right? And and that uh, is no longer going to happen. And so I think that's that's a good effect on the uh, sort of way in which these parallel proceedings uh, go, go forward. The 
majority, and you know, I, I have a paper with uh, with Artie and, and our colleague Jay Kaysen, uh about how these these cases are uh, are often litigated in parallel. The majority, about seventy percent of petitioners who come to the the IPR, are defensively responding to an infringement action in court, and so it uh, matters very much to the, the health of the system, the proper efficiency of the system, that what goes on in the PTAB should take account of what effect it's going to have on the district court litigation. Artie, do you agree? I think that the policy argument, the efficiency policy argument that SAS made is on balance probably correct. Yes, I do agree for all of the reasons that Greg and Sarab have articulated. Now, the concern that I would have is that, of course, this puts substantial workload burdens on the PTAB. And the PTO in general, but the PTAB maybe in particular, labors under the following set of problems. It has one year. The amount of money that it can charge is, is fixed. And if it tries to raise its fees, as it's now trying to do, it gets a lot of grief for that. So something's got to give. And if what gives is that PTAB just decides, well, we have complete discretion just to deny, this I know goes to your next question to some extent, um, then that's going to be a really bad outcome. Because if they just decide that this is a messy petition, we don't have the time, we're just going to deny it. I don't think that is an optimal outcome. You know, one other route that they could save money and time on is if they, in order to institute a IPR, they only have to establish the likelihood of success of, of, of invalidity of one claim. Uh, do you think there's any likely impact of this decision on PTAB procedures? <clears throat> where they, at least on a case-by-case -case basis, only address one claim and don't address all challenge claims or all prior art challenges? You're talking about in the institution In the decision. institution decision, yes. So I think that that's apparently, according to an article that you helpfully sent us, that according to one empirical analysis, they are doing that in a number of their institution decisions. They're just addressing one claim in the institution decision with any degree of um, specificity, shall say. Um, but that does strike me as a little bit peculiar because, of course, they have to address all the claims ultimately in their final written decision. So I'm not sure how much time they're saving at the end of the day, particularly because the year clock that they're so proud of meeting runs at once you institute. That's the one, that's a time when people really begin to focus on whether you're meeting your time deadlines. And so uh, I, do, I think it, it's sort of a slightly short-sighted way of, of saving time, perhaps. Um, and for other reasons as well, in terms of if you think of dispute resolution, the best way to do a dispute resolution is to have the adjudicator put as much information into the system as early as possible. In other words, have the adjudicator figure out what it thinks so that the parties can then settle around the, mm -hmm. the terms of that information that's put out into the system then it doesn't seem a particularly good way to do things either. Now, I'm not sure that IPRs are really meant to be about dispute resolution so much as they are supposed to perhaps, depending on one's perspective, address the public good question. In other words, is this a, a patent for the world at large that is a good thing? So I would, uh, I, I, I think I agree with your premises already and disagree with the outcome in the following way. Okay. The, um, the proposal that Justice Ginsburg made, you know, sort of sarcastically, saying, "Here's what the agency could do in its written, uh, in its institution decisions, and it would get us exactly back to where we were. The partial institution was already taken care of. Isn't this idea that I've just given you uh, reflective of what a massive waste of time that would be? I think it would actually be a really good idea for the agency to continue in its institution decisions to explain. I mean, it already, when you grant institution." I think institution decisions do a really good job of putting the patent owner on notice of why these things were instituted, what the, um, the sort of arguments are that you should plan to, to, uh, to contend with, precisely for the reason you said, which is to promote settlement. Now, settlement, of course, uh, as a quick sidebar, also uh, limits what has to go into a final written decision because 318A again says if a challenge, uh, if, if uh, a review is instituted and not settled, then X, Y, and Z. So the 
decision to deny and say, here's why we're denying everything. Here are the things that would have been okay had they been, you know, the preponderance or the majority or the large majority of the petition. But there's also this other uh, less meritorious stuff. Now we've just given the petitioner a roadmap to clear out all the uh, unmeritorious things and refile if they have the time uh, within the one-year time bar. Uh, and we're also providing a roadmap as a matter of administrative common law to everybody else who's going to file, uh, you know, in the in the days to come. So by doing that, what they're providing is an insight into how they're going to institute or not institute. It's going to promote more focused petitioning from uh, future petitioners. And I also think that it's going to uh, hold the agency basically in line with what burdens they allow petitioners to impose on patent owners. Because right now, partial institution for, for the time period that it existed allowed the agency to say, well, our workload isn't affected by this. We'll just keep the stuff we want. But petitioners could just keep throwing stuff at the wall and see what's stuck. And at least the tentative conclusions that we've seen from the Federal Circuit on estoppel effects were that, well, no, it would be unfair to petitioners to estop them on things that were not instituted. So petitioners have no incentive to discipline themselves. Patent owners are bearing the brunt of this. And the patent office, the PTAB, is not really concerned uh, or wasn't concerned uh, in any sort of uh, workload-related way with what they allowed petitioners to inflict on patent owners. Now, whatever the petitioner inflicts on the patent owner is also being inflicted to the same extent on the PTAB. So there's going to be greater discipline pretty much all the way around. And I think that would be uh, a good thing. It would lend itself to more reasoned decision making. Just one clarification. When I said that the PTAB would just deny the petition, I was not assuming, in fact, I was assuming that they would not take the time to give a roadmap to the petitioner. So, in other words, it was not Justice mm -hmm. Ginsburg's. I think, and I tend to agree with you, that mm -hmm. Justice, if, if the PTAB does act in the way that Justice Ginsburg perhaps sarcastically suggested, that would be a not bad thing. I, I, actually, I'm in violent agreement with you. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, that's not good. <laughs> wait, wait, you, wait, I mean, now you're reconsidering your, your position. <laughs> yeah. um, I have that effect on people sometimes. <laughs> um, but enough about my home life. Uh, the, uh, uh, first of all, I agree violently with the, with the notion that this has, is going to have a positive and disciplining effect on, on PTAB petitioners. I mean, there's just no... The throwing a throwing hundred claims against a wall and see what sticks is just not, it's not fair to the agency and it's not fair to the other side in, in PTAB litigation. Um, with regard to what they're doing at the institution phase and what they've been doing with regard to the long written decisions, I, I just point out again as a matter of statutory construction that if you read the, the statute carefully, section 314D, which is the institution provision talks about a determination. It's not a decision. It's a determination. And it's it's a decision whether or not to go forward. And that's, it's just, it's a, it's a we, we said that it would be a simple notice in the Federal Register that says we're going forward on this and on this petition, or we're not going forward on this petition is adequate to satisfy Section 314. And again, why do you do reason? Well, yes, it's helpful to the parties for settlement purposes, by and large, it's for the system. It's for it's for reviewability, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to write extensive dis decisions that can't be reviewed. Well, we have a number of questions left, but we thought we'd uh, only a few minutes left, so thought we'd open it up for questions from the from the group. Anyone have uh, any questions they'd like to pose? Well, then let me, oh, Professor Riley, no, go ahead. So I want to talk a little bit. Uh, you guys both suggested, uh, uh, Artie and Sarab, that uh, you thought it would be good, this roadmap thing where it's rejected and then refiled. But that also creates the extra work for the, for the patent office. It's more petitions that they have to review. It's they have to, to provide more information, et cetera. So it seems like with, I mean, unless we're expanding resources, with an agency that's already has a, a, a time requirements, time ceiling on these IPRs, where is that work time, I guess, going to come from? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think 
the the sort of bind that the PTAB finds itself in at the immediate uh, sort of after effects of SAS Institute is that there's a real temptation. I mean, the cases that were fully instituted will continue to be fully instituted. Cases that were fully denied, same thing. It's the borderline cases where they would have used partial institution to filter out the, the wheat from the chaff, uh, as it were, um, that there's a temptation to fully institute. And in fact, there uh, is a decision uh, of, of the cases about the, the 800 petitions, of the 800 petitions that were pending at the time that SAS Institute was uh, decided, about 18%, right? That was the, the figure that, that then Chief Judge Rushke pointed out. 18% of petitions, fairly small share, uh, had any partial institution involved in them. And so to figure that stuff out, the transition period while we could get all of these out, um, there was a strong thumb in the scale in favor of going back and fully instituting everything and there may also be a temptation to do, all, do that going forward because these are cases in which there's admittedly something wrong with the patent. Not everything, maybe not even enough, right? And so to do a full denial is implicitly and perhaps explicitly to say, we know there's something wrong with this patent, we're consciously choosing to do nothing about it, and that's a bad look, right? I think Justice Ginsburg's proposal handles that more than enough because what you're saying is, although we're not going to do enough about it because a policy of full institution would do quite a bit to increase our workload dynamically going forward, right? If we engage in this uh, much more reasoned decision making now, then we're going to save ourselves the workload. We're going to get fewer petitions, or excuse me, uh, more focused petitions with fewer arguments in them that are more carefully tailored to get um, a full institution rather than a full denial. And as a result of that, yes, you're making some more investment up front, but it's going to pay off fairly quickly, and it's going to lead to better, more focused petitions in the long run. Uh, and that, I think, is a reasonable way to get around this argument that, well, you, you said there's something wrong with this patent in your institution denial, and you chose to do nothing about it. Yes, but for a good reason. We're taking the longer view. And I think it's appropriate for the agency to do that. Well, we do have some PTAB judges up, uh, up to bat later on today. Maybe they can answer some of these questions, including whether the, the, the added claim burden, uh, especially for ones where they found there's no likelihood of success mm -hmm. on the merits, uh, is really going to be that substantial. Uh, but with that, I think our time is out. Thank you for participating, panel. And thank you. Thank you for